Yeah, there's kind of a flat place. You can put it right here. You can put it right here. What? A, a water bottle? If it's a bottle, it's fine. If you know what? I think I
Okay. Hello, everybody. So everybody has, I think, what? Move my water. Okay. Where will I put it so it won't fall? Okay. But it won't fit. Oh yes, please turn off your phones because it's being recorded. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Okay, I'm being instructed. I would suggest that the instructors come here and tell me what to do. Okay, is that better? Okay. All right, so everybody, including I, should shut off my phone, I guess. All right, sorry for, for, the, for the slow start, but lots of us were trapped in taxis coming up town. Okay, so I want to thank all of you for coming. And uh, before we start, I want to thank uh, Jim McMiniman, who got this whole thing together. And you'll see there's a whole list of people who were involved in creating this, including our wonderful daughters, Susan, Jenny, and Carolyn. Okay. So, actually, my name, well, my husband once introduced me as my wife, Leona Nevler's sister. And I think that was probably because we were at a party and we didn't know many people. And he was concerned because my actual name is Alberta. It's a name for school and for work and for the post office. And the, my other name, which used to be for family until the New York Times put it in the newspaper, is Boots. And that is usually family members who, and friends for many years who say that. So anyway, you can call me here. You can call me what you want. OK. So. I want to say, start by saying kind of why, why you're here. And I'm, I'm going to start with a little story about Larry's ending. So on March 23rd, 2018, Larry's lungs stopped access, accepting oxygen from the tank we had installed in our bedroom. On many levels, the end of his life was not a surprise. He had struggled increasingly with Parkinson for more than 10 years. He had a leaking aortal valve for even longer. And just before Thanksgiving, he had finished 35 days of proton radiation therapy for a squamous cell carcinoma in his mouth. That cancer probably was the result of radiation for a previous cancer 30 years before, a cancer that had taken over one side of his face. By mid-February, he started falling frequently and I could no longer help him get up. From then on, he was severely dehydrated, and he had increased double trouble swallowing. In the second week of March, he was hospitalized for aspiration pneumonia in his left lung. And after he returned home, he had two emergency visits to the ER. The first visit was on the night of March 20th for hydration and oxygen infusion. The next day, excuse me, the next day during that terrible spring snowstorm, he had to make a second ER visit. That was because when he left the hospital at two in the morning, his chart did not reflect his need for oxygen at home. Despite the snowstorm, if he wanted to receive oxygen at home, he was required to return to the hospital to be tested again. He did it in the snowstorm in an ambulance to the hospital, and after failing the necessary test, and also he returned in an ambulance, he returned home. The emergency visits brought bad news. His right lung showed something that was maybe pneumonia or maybe something else. His swallowing difficulties had left him with no ability to eat and no ability to take in water, except with sponges on his lips. He weighed 110 pounds. On the day before his life ended, he could not talk. 
At the beginning of this story, I said, on many levels, the end of his life was not a surprise. I included the words, on many levels, because on some levels, it did come as a surprise. Despite the misery of his last three weeks, when he could not stand alone, could not swallow, and so, and so could not eat or drink enough to overcome his dehydration, he was always working to live. In the hospital and at home, he worked with his grandchildren and his daughters to strengthen his legs. His eyes opened whenever the children and grandchildren appeared. On Tuesday, March 13th, a few days after his week in the hospital, he chose to attend our subscription concert at the chamber music concert of Lincoln Center. When he came home that night, he fell in our bedroom, and I had to call 911 to help him get up. But the following day, when a social worker asked him whether he wanted to talk about dying, he answered, it's not going to happen anytime soon. On Friday the 16th, our granddaughter took pictures of him at his regular session in the gym with his trainer, tossing a three-pound ball from side to side. On Monday, March 19th, he chose to keep his usual physical therapist appointment. He was not up to practicing with his special walker, but I have a picture of him moving up and down from a, from a bench. He moved slowly, seemingly painfully, and he moved only three times instead of his usual 10 times. Still, on Thursday, he worked on his legs with our daughters into the night. His caretakers saw him alive on Friday morning at 7. Two hours later, when the caretaker came out of the shower, Larry's life was over. After knowing Larry Grossman for 66 years and being married to him for 64 years, I cannot say that death was a bad choice for him. He was a man of action and talk. He would be alive without living. I want to remember Larry as I knew him for 99% of those years. The notes you have written to me started the process of reclaiming him. The photograph of Larry that we used in the invitation and the videos of Larry in action that you will soon see have continued that reclaiming. So we are here today to tell the stories of the Larry Grossman we know. Okay? We're going to hear the... See this. The secret to success of leadership is having a goal and being able to articulate it and persuade others that that's the way to go. And being able to articulate it. Larry Grossman was always ahead of his time. Yet he was Larry human Grossman enough to understand that his accomplishments were achieved for the benefit of human enough to understand that his accomplishments were achieved for the benefit of his parents of those in that. Where did that grow from, of course? His parents. There's a very strong sense, that, not only by my parents, but in the neighborhood of gratitude for the opportunities in this country, a passionate belief in democracy. Gratitude for the opportunities in this country, a passionate belief in democracy. And around the dinner table all the time of discussion of public issues and sense of real public responsibility, so I suppose it's where it caught me. I got a job when I saw that television was the big coming thing. At CBS, when I had just started an advertising and promotion department. And every week I'd go up to Fred Friendly and Ed Morrow and ask for a job in news and they'd <laughs> down. And then I went over to NBC to head advertising. And I had an idea to open a company that would concentrate doing the kinds of things that I knew about. Promotion, advertising, commercials, productions. For public affairs and for politics and for media clients. The first person who called me was Fred Friendly, the former oh. president of CBS News. And he was pushing the whole new idea of public television. So I was brought in as an advertising promotion guy to both put public television and PBS on the map and to figure out the ways of raising money for PBS on the map. The next thing I knew, somebody called and asked if I would want to come and save PBS, which was in big trouble. Larry did more than save PBS. He led the entire television the industry of leadership with a series of firsts, and being able to satellite feeds, and persuade closed others captioning, that that's the way live broadcasts of Senate confirmation. Larry Grossman was you can thank or curse 
Yet, my records was human enough to understand I said the way to show that public television's potential the is to open up the Senate hearings, hearings on the new cabinet ministers. Where did that come from? Uh, so that the this public can see who the new leaders would be. That. Uh, we said it all. We should be the first to have a half hour nightly news no uh, analysis program, but in the neighborhood, which was the McNeil Lara. Gratitude uh, for we should also do in this country documentaries and that's thought of the front line. Larry was characteristically self-effacing and matter-of-fact, but in Adman and his scores, he never had... Sense of real public responsibility, so I suppose that's where it caught me. I got a job when I saw that television was the big coming thing at CBS when they had just started an advertising and promotion department. And every week I'd go up to Fred Friendly and Ed Morrow and ask for a job in news and they'd be <laughs> down. And then I went over to NBC to head advertising and I had an idea to open a company that would concentrate doing the kinds of things that I knew about promotion, advertising, commercials, productions for public affairs and for politics and for media clients. The first person who called me was Fred Friendly, a former uh -huh. president of CBS News, and he was pushing the whole new idea of public television. And so I was brought in as an advertising promotion guy to both put public television, PBS, on the map and to uh, figure out new ways of raising money for it. The next thing I knew, somebody called and asked if I would want to come and save PBS, which was in big trouble. Larry did more than save PBS. He led the entire television industry with a series of firsts. Satellite feeds, closed captioning, live broadcasts of Senate confirmation hearings. You can thank or curse Larry Grossman. I said the way to show public television's potential is to open up the Senate hearings on the new cabinet ministers uh, so that the public could see who their new leaders would be. Uh, we set a goal. We should be the first to have a half-hour nightly news uh, analysis program, mm -hmm. which was the McNeil era. Uh, we should also do documentaries, and that started Frontline. Larry was characteristically self-effacing and matter-of-fact, but an ad man at his core, he never passed up an opportunity to promote his cause. PBS, PBS, we're not stuffy anymore. Oh. Unfortunately, PBS was not thrilled with our film and has asked for time to reply. Here, then, is the real, actual president of the Public Broadcasting Service, Mr. Lawrence K. Grossman. Mr. Grossman. Thank you, Brad. I came here to protest Saturday Night Live's outrageous claim that PBS is not stuffy anymore. The false charge that PBS is moving away from stuffiness has seriously damaged the unique image that public television's been nurturing for years. We demand a retraction and an apology from Saturday Night Live. We could also use some money. <laughs> Newt Minow was Larry's champion and partner starting at PBS. Larry was such an extraordinary person, a person with vision, a person with courage, and as I think about him, we had many similarities. We had long, happy marriages. We each had three daughters. We were very much family people. I dreamed of having a national public television service, and Larry really created it and developed it. One of our proudest moments at PBS was when we were faced with some pressure from our own government to cancel a program involving a Saudi princess who had been murdered. And Larry and I stood together against our own State Department to preserve the independence of PBS. After transforming sleepy educational TV at PBS into a masterpiece, he would take NBC News from number three to number one. The very first guy I thought of was Larry Grossman. So I, I sought him out. And to my surprise and delight, uh, the one job that he would leave PBS to take was to come here to head up NBC News. Larry moved network news out of the studio and into the world changing forever how it would be covered. Because we could use a satellite to transmit signals, and we sent the Today Show, which was in big trouble, to Moscow, and then to Peking, to, to China, to the Vatican, to travel throughout 
the Mississippi Valley. It was very exciting and very dramatic because it broke all kinds of rules. I remember Larry as a friend and as a boss, and he was splendid at both. When he and NBC parted ways, I recruited him as a fellow at Harvard Kennedy School, where he began research for the Electronic Republic. Us. We uh, redefined the word that community. The new generations, community used to and I know from my grandchildren, I see much of that, would have that sense. That was your focus on education and focus on how to use these new technologies, not just to buy things and not just to entertain yourself, you know, but to improve yourself and to learn things and to be curious about the world. What you need is a passion, and caring, and curiosity. And then you'll be all right. And if you had that passion, curiosity, and caring, Nearly then you can handle anything. Nearly a quarter century ago, Larry warned about other populist trends. I worry a lot about the public dialogue that, in many ways, has has deteriorated uh, because of this need to, uh, you know, to do go out all or nothing. Everything is black and white. There are no shades, no nuances. And I think we have to watch out for that. But he was always at heart an optimist. We worked together on another project with the major American foundations to adapt education to using the internet and the new technologies. And we managed uh, to get a bill through Congress, which is not an easy yes. thing to do, which created an institution which if, exists. If you're not hearing me very well, just raise your hand and I'll adjust the mic pioneer, or myself. Sage, Larry was all three. That's a very tough act to follow, all the perils and promise and particularly if I'm going to stay on script and within the allotted time as I promised to do, but I will do it. Larry's world was, uh, was a media world. I'm not, I'm not from that world. So I propose to talk about Larry as my close friend someone who was my friend for 83 years. And it was a friendship that began when we were thrown together by very sad circumstances. Larry's mother and mine, the two roses, as they were called, had been best friends since high school. His biological father, Nat Kugelmas, was a brilliant lawyer. Tragically, he died of cancer when Larry and I were three. It was during the depths of the Depression and the two roses decided it would make sense to consolidate households. They found a small house in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, and all of us moved in. The house had a third floor attic with two tiny rooms, one of which was assigned to each of us. Because the attic was separated from the rest of the house, we were quickly able to develop the little confidences and connections, ones that would end up binding us together strongly for life. My mother, my mother was a teacher. Larry's was a school administrator, which probably gave them a sense of empowerment to start us on a home learning program to complement whatever we were doing in school. Aided by flashcards that they prepared, Larry and I took our first steps together toward mastering the three R's. While our mothers were messing around with flashcards, the two of us were developing more important aspects of our relationship, like learning to be respectful of and to trust one another, to be proud of one another and to protect one another and eventually to share a lot of the same interests. I tended to be the mischief maker, recipient of inevitable penalties. Larry was the peacemaker, always there to plead my case to the parent who had handed down the sentence. In one instance which occurred during a hot summer when we were five or six years old, he suggested to my mother that barring me from visiting a local ice cream store with her and with Larry was a form of cruel and unusual punishment. As I recall, it didn't help, though. 
Happily for Rose, after three or four years of living together, she remarried and Larry and I were separated. Rose's new husband, also a Nat, was Nat Grossman. They moved into their own home, started a Grossman family, and added two more wonderful sons, Dan and Richard. The second Nat was also a lawyer, as well as an extremely gifted chess player. He became a major intellectual influence on Larry and trained him, as well as Dan and Richard, to think independently and critically and to support their thoughts with knowledge. In an era when reading was something that could occupy a significant part of a young boy's life, Nat was always coming up with great recommendations. It was he who introduced Larry to Charles Beard's Studies of the American Revolution, to a wonderful author of books about the settling of America's West, whose author was Joseph Altscheller, and also to the classic sports stories of Ring Lardner, including his great moral tale about Alibi Ike. Despite Nat's influence, Larry's occasional development didn't exactly follow a straight line. In fact, there was a time when it sort of ran off at a right angle. When he was getting ready to enroll in high school, Larry met some new friends. They told him they were applying to Brooklyn Tech, which was as good as it gets in science and technology. Despite having no interest in science or technology, at least not at that time, and probably in order to retain his incipient friendships, Larry decided to take a shot at the entrance exam for tech. To everyone's surprise, he was one of the select few to uh, pass, a success which unfortunately did not extend to his friends. Larry decided to attend tech, a decision that proved to be unwise since he soon found himself failing inspiring courses like mechanical drawing. <laughs> and he even had some difficulty with English. Fortunately, just as he was scheduled to start another inspiring course in masonry, a light bulb went off in Rose. She persuaded the family doctor to write a letter informing the school authorities that for reasons of health, Larry had to be permitted to transfer schools because he was seriously allergic to dust. Somehow, Rose's ruse worked and Larry made his way to Midwood High School, just down the street from their home at the time. He got back on a proper liberal arts track at Midwood, but the real intellectual blossoming occurred right here on Morningside Heights with his admission to Columbia, which again is what makes today's venue so much more meaningful as, as we look around. It started with the freshman courses in contemporary civilization and humanities and continued with studies with the historian Jacques Barzin, the sociologist, C. Wright Mills, uh, uh, sorry, Jacques Barzin, the uh, historian, C. Wright Mills, the sociologist, and other such luminaries. Larry also began working on Spectator. There he met an extraordinary group of new friends, including Max Frankel and Dick Wald. In fact, Dick will be ringing down the curtain this afternoon, so I hope I'm giving him some good lead-ins. It's fair to say that collectively, Max, Dick, Larry, and their spectator team, which also included Rune Arledge, represented a journalistic golden era at Columbia. When not whiling away his time at Spectator, Larry also devoted himself to Columbia's debate council, ultimately becoming its president. Of course he was a brilliant debater, but I confess that my principal memory of Larry and debating <clears throat> was the night of Columbia versus Oxford. At the English Speaking Union, where he showed up in the requisite black tie gear, all rented, but sporting an unrented pair of yellow socks that beamed brightly at the audience like a pair of headlights. The good news, though, was that Columbia still won the debate. 
Following college, Larry enrolled at Harvard Law School, probably with the expectation of following in the legal tradition of the two Nats. Despite having recorded brilliant scores in his LSATs, a year in Cambridge convinced him to, to decide that the law should best be left to others. Whereupon he departed, but not empty-handed. Since Radcliffe had offered the opportunity to meet Boots, not Alberta, but Boots, who soon became his wife. They left Cambridge for New York in June of 1953, commenced raising what ultimately became a wonderful, almost biblical family, three beautiful daughters, their husbands, grandkids, and great-grandkids. And Larry embarked upon his extraordinary career. From my perch, both as an observer and as someone who discussed these things with him many times over the years, there were two lodestars that always guided Larry, not only in his executive decisions, but also post-NBC in his writings and in the visionary project <clears throat> that he undertook. One, of course, was the First Amendment with its protection of freedom of expression. The other was what Larry saw as virtually a reciprocal of the First Amendment. That was the necessity for the public to know and to have better access to the information it needed to know because he believed an informed and active citizenry is the primary bulwark of the Republic. Guided by these lodestars, Larry turned his life into a rare and remarkable journey. As his friend for virtually all of it, I feel extraordinarily lucky to have been part of the ride. Thank you. I'm Dan Grossman, Larry's brother. I believe the signature story of Larry's career was his challenge to the license of WPIX Channel 11 in New York. Uh, because this extraordinary battle took place almost 50 years ago, I'm not sure that even Larry's daughters and certainly not his grandchildren um, know enough of this story. The law has now been changed, but originally the FCC would license um, companies for television channels, requiring them to broadcast in the public interest. And if you did not broadcast sufficiently in the public interest, the license could be taken away after three years and given to someone else who would better broadcast in the public interest. In practice, taking away a major television license never happened. These licenses, worth hundreds of millions of dollars even then, were generally held by very powerful and politically influential companies. WPIX was licensed to the Tribune Company, owner of the Chicago Tribune, uh, for many years of the 20th century, the newspaper with the largest circulation and largest advertising revenue in the entire country. They also owned highly profitable WGN television station in Chicago. WGN was the, stood for the legend of the Chicago Tribune, world's greatest newspaper. And they owned the Daily News in New York. The Tribune Company had an interesting and controversial history. It was led from the 20s up through the, much of the 50s by Colonel Robert McCormick, a founder of the American First Committee, and he and the Tribune were the most virulent opponents of FDR and of the country's entry into World War II. By 1969, the Tribune Company had become more conventionally corporate, but Larry felt WPIX was doing a pitifully weak job in news 
and even uh, was in some ways dishonest in its news coverage. So Larry came up with the idea of challenging the license for WPIX and asking that, it, that Channel 11 be instead awarded to a company that I, a kid just a couple of years out of law school, structured and formed for Larry called Forum Communications, Inc. Larry's small advertising company at the time was a risky enough venture. If our mother, Rose, had known the extent of the risks Larry was taking in, in effect, conducting a nuclear strike against one of the most powerful and influential companies in the United States, she would have had an immediate heart attack, a, a real one, not a uh, metaphorical one. Larry gathered together as shareholders of Forum, a diverse group of New Yorkers, Ronnie Eldridge, Harry Belfonte, Sonny Fox, Paul Roebling of the um, Brooklyn Bridge family, and others who may be in this room today. Through me, Larry was able to bring on board Leon Levy, head of Oppenheimer and Company, um, whose memory of Colonel Parker and the Chicago Tribune prior to World War II gave great enthusiasm to his investment. And this investment was financially crucial to uh, Forum. Uh, Larry also brought on board Mike Finkelstein, a scrappy communications lawyer um, who was able to, on a shoestring budget, fight the battle over many years, a shoestring budget of a few hundred thousand dollars compared to the many millions of dollars being expended by the Tribune Company. This license challenge was very much Larry, unconventional, idealistic, a little Mr. Smith goes to Washington idealistic, and brave. I remember a, a savvy Wall Street investor warning Larry that starting a fight to deprive a major company of a hundred million dollar asset and tens of millions of dollars of income would not only result in every aspect of Larry's existence being investigated and attacked, but might also result in Larry being shot and killed. Uh, Larry never hes hesitated. He, he was fearless. So what happened in the legal battle? Amazingly, Forum came very close to winning. Uh, despite the fact that virtually every political leader in New York ran to pander to the Daily News and WPIX by testifying in WPIX's favor. Maya Abraham Beam testified that WPIX had done an outstanding job in the public interest. After nine years of back and forth, the, FDA, the FCC decided in a four to three decision with a, a very strong, bristling, long dissent that WPIX would remain, would retain, w, would retain its license. But to um, prevent an appeal to the DC Circuit Court of Appeals by Forum, at that point, the Tribune Company settled with Forum at a price that was quite profitable to the Forum shareholders. By then, Larry was reluctantly gone from Forum, having been appointed president of PBS, which created a conflict, forcing him to give up his forum shares. I have no inside information, but it was my understanding that Fred Friendly, then head of the Ford Foundation's efforts to develop public television, and professor of journalism at Columbia, broadcast journalism, and godfather of the interconnection of public television stations which could lead to leading to the creation of PBS recommended Larry and Larry only as president of PBS and a major reason Fred Friendly did this 
was Larry's brave and idealistic challenge of the Channel 11 license. This led to Larry's outstanding career as president of PBS, and I believe to his next exciting role as president of NBC News. Hello, everyone. My name is Sonny Fox. And um, I was prepared to speak only about what you just heard about. So I'm trying to think of what else. This is going to be a pretty short presentation now, since that one was rather encyclopedic. Um, actually, I wasn't, I, I'd known Larry as a friend in Westport for many, many decades, Larry and Boots and um, dined with him many times. And I've always thought of Larry as being older than I am, though he was not, as I am of almost all of you. I was older. And yet, because I tend to be loud and impetuous, and Larry was thoughtful and quiet, he came across as far more mature than I was. And I always considered him to be smarter and wiser than I was. And he was. So it was a great surprise to me when one day <clears throat> Boots had asked me to lay down a promo for some benefit she was conducting, as she always was, at the radio station locally. And when it was over, Larry said, come on across the street to Bill's smoke shop and let's have a cup of coffee. I said, fine. And knowing Larry, as I just described him, I was really quite surprised when he opened the conversation and he said, you want to hear an idea that'll either make us rich or drive us out of the business? And then he proposed exactly what you heard. He said, in June, WPX's license is up for renewal. And I said, you know, God sometimes picks very strange messengers because I was thinking about the exact same thing. So in that afternoon in Bill's smoke shop, we agreed to be partners on that, and then brought in Ronnie Eldridge as our third partner. I won't go into a lot of the details of what transpired. Um, I'll, I'll mention a few grace notes. We informed the FCC, finally, that we were coming in. It was getting close to the June deadline. We were certainly going to come in with a, with a challenge. They were informed of that. About four weeks before the termination of that time period, lo and behold, the FCC came through with a handful of early renewals, and among them happened to be Channel 11. And the head of Channel 11, Thread Thrower, went on the news saying, see, ain't going to be no challenge. We've got our license renewal. We took the case to the circuit court. I believe it was circuit court, and they reversed that finding of the FCC and allowed us to file. Now, you heard about the huge amount of wealth that was behind the, the, uh, the owners of the license. Actually, it was the Medill Patterson Trust, which owned all of that. And we had so very few resources. Larry went out and got a, got a Mike Finkelstein, that lawyer, and it was Mike Finkelstein against two huge uh, uh, law firms, one from in Washington and one from New York, which was on the other side. It was a rather poignant scene as those hearings went on. There was Mike with one assistant, and there was the formidable table of the other attorneys. I remember once I was at my office and I got a call from Mike. He said, what are you doing today? I said, why? He said, my assistant is sick. Can you come down and sit with me? I said, sure. I got down during the hearing, went on. And he turned to me at one point, he said, would you go in that folder and find 725 for me? I said, well, he said, you'll find it. So I busied myself over here, the hearing went on, I couldn't find 725. About 15 minutes later, I said, Mike, I can't find it. He said, that's okay, just look busy. So that's how, how unbalanced the, the competition was. 
And then about four years into it, Mike, we, I, I, um, we lost Larry to PBS. And so we carried on without the benefit of his wisdom and his creative energies and kept it going for another six years until it was gone at that four to three that you heard about. It was Charlie Ferris, the chairman of the board of the FCC, who wrote a scathing opinion about PIX. <clears throat> Unfortunately, though he was the chairman, he only carried one vote. And so we lost four to three. We thought very hard about going back into the court, renewing. We went back to the FCC and we said, what would take, what would take place? It turned out it would be another five years before we could really get a hearing again. And we had kept our investors on the string for 10 years already, so we agreed to settle. And, uh, and that was the story of WPIX. It was a wonderful experience to be with Larry through that. His creative energy, his imagination, his dedication, it would really suffuse the effort. And it was well worth making. We made WPIX, a, if not a better station, a less bad station. And we sent waves through the industry that they were vulnerable. And just doing that helped improve things a little. Now, I can't tell you we've kept improving, we've regressed, but at least we did that thing together. And it was that that was really what I wanted to share with you today. It was a different part of Larry. It wasn't Larry as a part of a leader of a large corporate structure or heading off in other directions. It was Larry the rebel. It was Larry instinctively wanting to do better and make the industry better. I shared that with him because I felt the same way. And our memories of Larry will always be fervent with so many other dimensions, but that's the one I wanted to share with you today. Thank you for allowing me to be here. Grossman would put me behind a podium that says Columbia University. I wish my mother was here. <clears throat> my name is Suzanne Weil. I, am I not doing this? Should I do it over? No. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <clears throat> my name is Suzanne Weil. <clears throat> I went to PBS as the director of Arts and Humanities Programming. I somehow magically became the senior vice president for programming, one of Larry's more mysterious decisions. <clears throat> I'm pleased there was a, a reference to the death of a princess. I joined PBS while the system was in the throes of that mess. As directors of arts and humanities, I was out of it. We had princesses too, they were being dragged out of uh, castles, uh, screaming in high seas and wearing horrible clothes. The documentary Princess was a serious matter which managed to infuriate a foreign government, which didn't and still doesn't fool around, forcing Washington funders, boards, and stations into corners. It was a brilliant introduction to my new job, able to observe Larry Grossman with, uh, in action for the first time. It was epic for me, bingo, I came to the right place. There it was, freedom of thought, principle, and enormous courage. They could have backed down in the pro in, and in the process give away the store. They didn't. It was a small staff, feisty and not afraid of much, the gift of a demanding leader, demanding endless rehearsals for presentations, for stations and for the press. We learned to be prepared. In order to talk about Lawrence Grossman, the president of the Public Service Broadcasting Service, I believe it's important to put the place and the job in context. This is a how did he do it moment. I'm gonna do something courageous. I'm gonna attempt a brief summary of the structure of public television to illustrate his talent, clarity, patience, a big one, and endless diplomacy. It should be noted that this loony setup came from the outside. It's not the system's fault. Valiant people navigating a, a complicated enterprise. If after this you think you understand it, you don't. Here goes. There were about 350 stations when we were there. State, university, school board, and community licensees, and independent producers. 
Some stations produce local programming, some national, some both. Some acquire programs, mostly from overseas, more now. One of my favorite Larry's was, thank goodness the British speak English. Pro programs are submitted to PBS, which accepts or rejects them to build a national schedule, which the stations can accept or reject. We had a, we had a, small, development, <clears throat> a small development fund, which I'm proud to say funded some of the jewels of public television. Larry's eyes and ears were, of course, central. The list is endless. Ken Burns' Vietnam series, Eyes on the Prize, the, new hour, the News Hour, starting first with McNeil Lair and then going for an hour, a first. Live, all the live from, from cultural series, endless. All at his watch, hard standards to live up to. Pledge week, I'm not going there. Looming over, the pub, uh, looming over this is the public the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, CPB, which receives grants from the federal government, let's hope, um, which goes to station and block grants according to their size. They make program grants, usually development or finishing funds. The stations pay dues to PBS, a membership organization. I told you we're not going to understand this. All this to say is there's no way to please everyone. There are legitimate com concerns from community to community, but when the chips are down, one must take a stand. Larry taught us to never lose sight of the mission. As demanding as those difficult decisions, he was able to honestly work through differences, win or lose, and this is important to me. The miracle was that he retained the respect of all factions. I'm still in touch with many members of the programming department. Two are here, Bob Cantor and Kathy Weiler. <clears throat> I had a note from one who's out west. When he learned of this memorial, he ended his message with, he was an elegant man. I can't think of a better way to end mine. Thank you. My name is Susan Grossman. I'm Larry Grossman's eldest daughter. But I'm actually not going to spend much time talking about my life with him as his daughter. There's raking leaves in the backyard, his soda antics at birthday parties, his teaching me to drive, agreeing to do so without resistance when I was 15, earlier than authorized, in his station car, an old manual tr transmission wood paneled Jeep his willingness to welcome friends in large numbers to the house and pool, his tremendous generosity of Sandy and me, of Becca and Ben, his true delight in his great-granddaughters Hazel and Ada, delight in seeing the bellies of the new grand great-grands on the way. Hearing what I have heard from so many of you who knew Larry in his work life, as a friend and relative, you're probably not too surprised to hear that he was a generous, thoughtful, good, kind, loving, and supportive dad. His work life was an important part of my life as his daughter. I was always impressed by and proud of what I knew of him at work. Though perhaps my earliest glimpse of his real power was when I got to meet Captain Kangaroo, I also remember Grandma Rose felling that he was NBC's youngest vice president, his battle to take over P WPIX from the bad guys, his presidency of PBS. I do think I had mixed feelings about Rebecca spending time with him with President Reagan. On the other hand, I was thrilled that he was willing to put on his stuffiest suit and rebut C Saturday Night Live's making fun of CBS, his presidency of NBC and maybe the most lasting and important, the digital promise. I've spent a lot of time with dad and mom, particularly in the past few years, particularly to try to give back some of the support as, as dad and they dealt with the most recent load of crap that his body threw at him. And with all that, his strength and outlook were remarkable, muscling through Parkinson's and the most recent cancer and treatment never complaining, always looking forward. We never talked much about how he felt about all of that. 
when we did, I'm sure he would have been, said something like, it's not such a big deal, much less than others have to cope with. Maybe it was a year ago that I came upon the pages of a book that he had started. It was reading the preface that gave me a glimpse of his reactions. It starts at Montefiore Medical Center, where Dad's aunt Shirley was an inter internist. Here are a few excerpts. On March 1990, I entered Montefiore to be treated for an unusual form of cancer. My disease had been misdiagnosed three years earlier by pathologists at Yale. By the time I came to Montefiore, the tumor had invaded the whole inside of my cheek and taken over the right side of my face. In the spring and summer, three operations largely restored the right side of my face. By the time the Montefiore team had finished with me, the most visible consequences of their work were a large scar leaving me with a rather raffish look, the loss of half of my beard, prompting me to sh shave off the other half in order not to look too eccentric, and the disappearance of my smile. I also lost my ability to whistle, not a small handicap when trying to hail a cab in New York. During the 11 days that I spent at Montefiore recuperating from that first operation, those relatively benign results, that's a true Larryism, did not seem possible. But the surgery itself was not the only source of my discomfort. I wondered whether my years in television were over. I had only recently started a brand new working life. Surgery on my face seemed an almost metaphysical extension of what was happening to the industry in which I had spent my career. It too was going through major revamping. The major players, the commercial networks were being cut down in the most visible ways. During the day, outside my hotel room, my hospital room, I watched the sprawling third world city neighborhood. Like those people, I was a long way from the world of power and influence downtown. I had become an insider looking in. A month after leaving Montefiore following my first surgery, I fulfilled a long-standing commitment to speak at Washington State University's Edward R. Murrow School of Communications. After my operation, I tried to get out of, get out of the, giving the talk. But as my wife pointed out, a side of my face might be bandaged, but I was perfectly capable of delivering a talk. That balmy April night, I talked about what I had learned from my experience with cancer and drew connections to the work that was needed for television. Each of us make, take, must take control of our own treatment and our own life. We must not hesitate to ask questions, not simply accept our fate, or experts' advice. If it is important, people must take control of the monster themselves. The, book gave me a pre a pre the book's preface gave me a glimpse of the pain that Dad had gone through physically, emotionally, and professionally. I also saw that perhaps with the assistance of pro prodding from Alberta, he coped with that pain by dusting himself off, looking around to see what happened, and setting off to move forward to make things better in the world around him. I'm Jenny Peltz, the middle daughter. Sorry. We've all been hearing and reading notes from so many of Dad's friends and colleagues. They all have the same theme. He was the nicest, kindest person to be with and work with. They learned so much from him and were their, the beneficiary of his wisdom. That really doesn't surprise me at all, since I think I certainly benefited from what he and both he and Mom taught me and Susan and Carolyn. He was always such a supportive dad, grandfather, and even great-grandfather. We always had such great times. I remember taking turns with my sisters going to the Knicks games in New York City because he had season tickets. That's when the Knicks were really good. I especially remember one time when we were, went to the game the same day we were going to Long Island to Rosen Nats before a Seder. We were 
we were late because of the game, but we told him it was because of the traffic. Some of the greatest memories of when, it was when I was young was when he, how he kept everyone, in, everybody entertained at my birthday parties. He would go around the room, dining room table serving soda. You asked if you asked for orange soda, and he would start to pour you ginger ale. And just before the 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 soda hit the bottle, all the kids in the room would say, no, she wanted orange soda. He just wanted to have fun. Some more memories. He made the best sandwiches for me for school lunches with the leftovers that, from the great dinners that mom had made. No PB&J for me. It was roast beef sandwich on rye. All of my friends wanted to trade and were really jealous. Always in tennis whites on weekends, going to Longshore to play and teaching us when we were young. He loved to play and keep doing tennis even though his knees were getting bad. Teaching me how to drive instead of taking driver's ed. I would, he would do all of this even after commuting every day back and forth on the train from Westport to New York City and back. Dad never or rarely complained that certainly was true when he was sick. He was always a trooper and wouldn't give up. That's something I always remember. Sorry. Hi, Care. Any interesting new clients? I'm Carolyn, the youngest. Checking in on work, that was typically the first thing Dad would do as I'd kiss him hello after driving from Boston around 9.45ish, just as Mom was serving dinner. Well, that was after asking how I was feeling. My health isn't great. He always had that cowering dog look about him when he asked. Do I lie all better? No, wouldn't work, but damn, he wished it were so. The idea of illness terrified him when it came to his girls or anyone he loved himself too, really. How's the money supply? You guys okay? I'm a communications and public affairs consultant. Good at the work part, not so much the billing part. And the projects I'm drawn to most are the pro bono ones, but money is not an issue. I was young during the LKG days, um, but I remember legendary stories of public service campaigns working for only losing political candidates, the infamous black hand print sent in the mail to a bigwig client who never paid his bills. It worked. Some of my favorite childhood memories include taking the train with dad to the Channon building, getting to color in the great Herb Blue Balance studio, dad asking my opinion, which of Herb's designs did I like best? It was a comfort to dad when I partnered in business with Joel, Six Sigma engineer, co-conspirator in his Take Care of Carolyn camp. After what did the doctor say, new projects need money? It was always doing any painting, sculpture, no? Come on, Care, that's a shame. Now that was exasperating. He was also on my case for staying up all night working. I'm my mother's daughter in that regard. I deliberately don't do art because once I start, I can't stop. A pitchman always, Larry Grossman was relentless and effective. After dad finished his 35 rounds of radiation, he wore me down. My muse, his favorite photograph of his great granddaughters, Ada and Hazel are perched atop the oven in Gaga Boots and Larry's Westport kitchen, each holding a bag of cookies, challenging the viewer in a singer sergeant like stare. That led to two more done for the Charles River Community Health. I'm on the board. Those were directly dad inspires inspired. Dad had traveled to the Philippines, his client, the Ministry of Health. 
He came back with custom-made pants. The stripes went around the circumference of his legs instead of up and down. The project goal was to get mothers to change behavior, long-standing customs about what to feed or not feed their babies. Dad used a popular soap opera to spread the word. I took a page from his playbook. My works are based off of 2009 photos I took at a lead screening event at minor league baseball games with lead poisoning prevention messages mixed in. Joel and I are both appointed members of the Mass Department of Public Health Clinical Lab Advisory Committee. In March, the members, mostly MD, PhDs, and laboratorians voted me, a BA art history major, to be its next chair, kind of a big deal. Dad was in Norwalk Hospital. Joel drove me down from Boston right after the meeting. It was evening when I got there. He was in tough shape, badly dehydrated, eyes closed. It was unclear how much he was taking in. I kissed him hello, told him my news. That's terrific care. I'm so proud of you, he whispered. He opened his eyes and looked at me. Are you doing any art? I was ready for him this time. Yes, I said. I let him know Hazel and Ada are staring down the community room of our new health center in Waltham. Strikeout Lead Newark is the centerpiece of Waltham's clinical space, and Strikeout Lead Camden hangs in our Alston Brighton facility. I showed him on my phone. He could not have been more thrilled. Mom and Dad and our family's three-generation fund have supported Charles River. About half our patients are uninsured, and most are immigrants or refugees, and we've been hard hit since the election. We had an amazing dad. He did important things, knew really famous people. Although he never did meet George Washington or Abe Lincoln, I asked him that when I was little and was a little puzzled that he seemed upset. Um, people do, who do great things for the world sometimes are assholes to the one he loved. They love, not my dad. I got this text from Beth Fooey the morning he died. He was a great man and a lovely man. I'll never forget how welcoming he and your mom were to me during our high school years. Got lots of notes like that, we all did. Thank you, Dad, it sucks you're gone. You would have enjoyed this a lot. I'm Austin Quigley. I have been a member of the faculty here at Columbia for more than 20 years, and for 14 of those years, I served as Dean of Columbia College. And it was during those 14 years that I got to know Larry so very well. On behalf of everyone at Columbia, let me just thank everyone in the family for allowing us to share with you this memorial event for someone in whom we at Columbia also take enormous pride. I want to um, echo Mark's comment earlier that this building and this room in particular is a very, very appropriate place to celebrate Larry's life. For more than a hundred years, this room has hosted events to honor people of great distinction from around the nation and around the world. But none more appropriately, perhaps, than Larry, whose distinguished life was always, amongst other things, a Columbia life, and not just because he was an undergraduate here. Columbia has long been able to confer upon its graduating students the social stature that is commensurate with its, its historical achievements and its international standing. But this is by no means a one-way street, as its graduating students go on to make major achievements of their own in every field of human endeavor. The success of those alumni contributes further to Columbia's historical standing and educational and renown to, indeed, the legacy that it can hand on to future students. 
There are few graduating classes that have conferred upon alma mater such transferred distinction as the class to which Larry belonged, the legendary class of 1952. Together, a small group of men from that class dominated for a generation the nation's communications media, and their innovations continue to this day to influence the public life of the nation. But Larry has left his mark upon this institution in his own particular ways that I would like to reflect on for a moment. Even during the years when his family and professional career required his full and devoted attention, Larry stayed closely involved with his college and his classmates. For most of the 14 years that I was dean of the college, for example, Larry served on the college's board of visitors. That board is the dean's chief source of strategic advice and public consultation in planning the future of the college. I thus got to know Larry very well, as this, as is often the case in the history of Columbia, was a time of fairly radical and fairly controversial renewal of what we thought we were doing and why. What always impressed me in these often heated debates in the college's board of visitors was Larry's typically good-humored but always carefully measured conviction. He was repeatedly, I noted, a man who knew how to command a room even when everyone was dealing with the most contentious of issues. This I found remarkable and always felt I should try in my own impoverished way to emulate, without, I should say, a great deal of success. Two examples, however, will serve to characterize the importance of what he was able to say and do in these years on the Board of Visitors. Though financial aid to needy students seems like an evident good thing, it is also a very, very expensive policy. And at times of budgetary crises, which tend to recur, it inevitably comes up for review one more time. Remembering his own youthful experience of nurturing large ambitions in little rooms, Larry always supported efforts to make the Columbia experience, through financial aid, available to those who could not otherwise afford to come here and he directed a considerable proportion of his own financial resources to that important goal. But establishing the compelling and persuasive picture was what mattered at that time. Financial aid, he would argue, benefits both the students who receive it and those who do not. The excellence of the education the college provides depends in significant part upon its inclusiveness upon the wide range of voices that it brings to bear, upon intellectual inquiry and social exchange. In these big picture terms that he brought once more to everybody's attention, the inclusiveness of the student body is not just a desirable option, but an institutional and educational necessity. The second example of his big picture wisdom and his capacity to distill complicated issues into two or three fine phrases was when a particularly controversial speaker was invited to speak on campus. This sparked the kind of controversy that was as intense then as it is now, not least amongst the college's board of visitors, who had some significant say in these matters. I remember this, this particular occasion well, which is giving me some pause to try to enunciate what was said there, and I want to get it right. When Larry took his turn to speak, and you can see how well I remember it, he summarized with his characteristic authority the basic principle at issue. He reminded us once more that the price we all pay for tolerating opinions with which we radically disagree is much lower than the price we will pay if we set out to prevent those opinions from being voiced. Constraints upon one individual's right to express a disturbing opinion can all too easily evolve into a constraint upon the ability of all individuals 
particularly those with little power, to resist the abuses of authority of those in higher places. As dean, I carried some of Larry's phrases and moral fervor with me wherever I went. Indeed, as a private institution committed to the public good, Columbia's broadest goals and ideals have been reinforced and strengthened not only by Larry's ideas and achievements, but also by the example he has left behind. We are all particularly aware at the present time that if the hard-earned principles of the past are not to atrophy into the empty slogans of the present, each generation must take on the responsibility of actively renewing those principles in their public lives and actions. In so many of his inspirational and influential words and deeds, Larry did more than his part to discharge that intergenerational responsibility. As we join Larry's family this afternoon in celebrating his life, we cherish together the example he has set of how it is possible to interweave a fulfilling family life with notable professional achievement and indispensable public service. Everyone who knew Larry enjoys a life enriched by that experience. And we will all carry that enrichment with us until the end of our days in important and enduring ways. Larry will always remain one of us. Can't quite reach over my belly. My name is Rebecca, and I'm Larry and Boots's eldest grandchild. My grandfather had a profound influence on my life. This is in part because of the life he created for himself. We all know the amazing career he had and the mark he left on this country and the world through his work. Not all grandfathers have stood up to Jack Welsh in the name of protecting high quality news as a critical public service or placed an enormous bet on the future of TV programming being delivered by strange machines in the sky called satellites, or developed legislation and the infrastructure to ensure digital education is available to millions of people throughout their lives. A career as successful and principled as his has always been a guide, but there was much more to his influence than that. My grandfather was deeply interested in me and my brother and cousins and how we think about and approach the world. As an extended family, we were lucky to spend a lot of time together. Memories from my childhood take place overwhelmingly in my grandparents' house in Westport and shaped me. We are all crowded around the kitchen table or lounging in the backyard or piled on top of each other in the living room. We're surrounded by delicious food. Newspapers and magazines are somehow at once both piled up in stacks around the place and also scattered everywhere. The TV or public radio is on in the background to a political talk show. We're all talking to and over each other, debating about recent events, historical topics, or in many cases, the veracity of some dumb factoid, which often leads to our greatest debates until someone finally looks up the answer. Occasionally, tears are shed. These times with my family instilled in all of us a sense of curiosity, interest in learning, and an openness to ideas. The messages we took with us were about the importance of access to good, high-quality information and education, and of working for the greater good. And importantly, a commitment to one's principles above all else. My grandfather has been a part of nearly every major decision I have made. I would almost always seek out his advice, or at the very least, ask myself during the process, what would he think about this? From seeking internships, to selecting college and graduate school, to finding my next job, and even my husband. I'll admit that sometimes this felt more like, of a, weight, more like a weight than a guide, but what I have always known is that he had high expectations, but not unreasonable standards. 
His love and support was unconditional and generous. I'd like to tell one story that I think reflects a slightly different Larry Grossman, one where he isn't the picture perfect of thoughtfulness, but it is emblematic of him in other ways. It is 1984, and my mother Susan is in labor with my brother, Ben. I'm in the waiting room at the maternity center watching Sesame Street, basking in the final moments of my happy life as an only child. <laughs> Suddenly, my grandfather bursts into the room and without warning or permission from me, changes the channel to news. I was three and a half and I was pissed. I've left out the fact that this was November 9th, 1984, three days after Reagan was elected president. Um, and Larry was president of NBC News at the time, but this context didn't matter to me as a three and a half year old. I think I remember it so vividly because in many ways the behavior was out of character for him. He was normally exceedingly kind and generous, especially with his grandkids. But I think, in a way, this incident captures him perfectly. He was always passionate about two things, his family and his commitment to the news business and information as a public service. I don't think it is an accident that I've ended up making my career in news. It wasn't part of any grand plan, but I joined NPR right after college, thanks in large part to a door my grandfather opened and haven't left news media since. Our mutual interest in the business of news gave us a lot to talk about, and I was lucky to have a deep, prescient expert to consult on tough questions I wrestled with at work. Even as he got farther away from the specifics of today's issues plaguing the industry, he always wanted to talk about them and could easily keep up with the complicated and nuanced challenges created by technologies and platforms and also ha often had great ideas about dealing with them. In the months since he's been gone, I've missed his counsel. And I miss him deeply. I feel his absence all the time. But he is with me as much as he ever was, in my head as I make tough decisions at work and in life, in my heart as I spend time with my family and my gorgeous troop of cousins. I see him in my daughter Hazel's smile. And all of these things gave me great comfort, as he always did. Hi, I'm Ben, um, Larry's grandson. Uh, Grandpa Larry was a huge figure in all of his grandchildren's lives. Um, I only realized it in adulthood, I think, but a lot of the confidence I had as a kid stemmed just from seeing uh, Grandpa's success and his achievements and thinking, if he was my grandfather, then surely I had a little bit to offer. Uh, sometimes this confidence, maybe often, was a little misplaced, like when I was editorializing about the dangers of corporate concentration of news to my fellow fourth graders on the playground. But usually, a big part of the drive I think all of us as his grandchildren had was a dir direct result of his encouragement and his example. He was modest. I can't really ever rem remember hearing him brag about his own achievements. I, I think I heard the most about it today, actually. But uh, he was never shy in vocalizing his support for us or to push us to pursue excellence. Uh, but it wasn't just excellence for its own sake or personal glory. It was for something meaningful in the world, for the greater good. Uh, Grandpa went through a lot in his life. We heard about some of that today. The loss of his father, cancer, which left him with an entirely different face. Parkinson's, Jack Welsh. <laughs> he had every right to be angry or bitter, but he was neither of those things. I remember I was uh, quite young when Grandpa had cancer, uh, but the first time I saw him was uh, after a surgery. My parents uh, warned me that he would look different, um, worried that I might be afraid. But unless you'd been told about these traumas as I was, you'd never have known it from his demeanor. He was optimistic and upbeat and curious and encouraging. Uh, until the very end. And I'll always be thankful to him and to our grandmother for instilling these values in their daughters and in us, and uh, I only hope to live up to them uh, and to be that example for my kids.
Hi, I'm Hillary, one of his granddaughters. Um, so as much as we are all proud to be his grandchildren, it was clear that Grandpa Larry was exceptionally more proud to be our grandfather. Always delighted to hear about what was going on in our lives, sitting back in his chair and listening curiously, offering words of encouragement and, right, and asking the right probing questions. That's great, pal, he would frequently say. He and Grandma Boots were always happy to travel to support us grandchildren at our life events, such as graduations, which I'm sure he would say was his duty as his grandfather to be present at. But both Grandma and Grandpa would also go out, go out of their waves to make us feel special. Coming to my soccer matches or high school softball games in Van Cortland Park, and more than once making the eight hour schlep up to Maine to see my sister and me at camp on visiting day. He was also the man to see as a precocious 14 and a half year old when you wanted to learn to drive and didn't want to ask your own father because you knew he would shut you down. <laughs> but grandpa was happy to take on the life risk. We would sneak out to the Staples parking lot and drive around, then drive back to the house and only acknowledge our illicit activities after returning. And I knew I couldn't get in trouble because Grandpa was older than Dad. Grandpa Larry was the most caring, loving, and impressive grandfather. And I will hold his memory and lessons he taught us dearly for the rest of my life. Hi, I'm Allie, the youngest granddaughter, or grandchild, Jenny's daughter. Grandpa Larry brought so much light into all of our lives, and I've always been so grateful to have such a generous, thoughtful, and caring grandpa. One thing I can say about him is that he always had an opinion, and might I add, a very good and purposeful one. What amazed me was how present he always was, even when it was hard for him to speak and contribute to conversations at times due to his Parkinson's. I remember grandma always stopping the conversation at the dinner table and say, Lar, what do you think? And he would always have a well thought out answer. He was always there and he cared about everyone and everything. Little things like offering guests strength the second they would come into the house or picking up every piece of crumb off of the floor. A great teacher, he always believed in us. He listened to my ideas, helped me write letters pursuing job opportunities, taught me how to play tennis, and was always considerate of my height. He even brought a step stool when teaching me how to make fresh squeezed OJ at the counter, kitchen counter when I was growing up. He had a special connection with everyone, an extremely strong and different relationship with every grandchild. Even his caretakers, Pat, Woody, Dan, and Kyle, would say to us how much joy he brought into their lives and their relationships were so unique compared to any other client they had ever worked with. I also think we can all say we totally bragged about Grandpa. I thought it was the coolest thing ever that he was on a Trivial Pursuit card and on SNL and would tell all my friends about it. I bragged that he was so generous, charismatic, so loved, and just the epitome of the most exceptional grandfather. Grandpa, you set a great example for all of us. I will love and miss you forever and will continue to cherish our memories together. I hope to one day follow in your footsteps and conquer the world like you did. I love you. I thought because of the setting, I would talk about uh, going to Columbia because my grandfather was very excited about that. Um, he lived to help other people, but he was also keenly aware that some help is unhelpful. This is a lesson he learned from his brief tenures at Brooklyn Tech and Harvard Law, as you've heard before. When I applied to Columbia, he didn't ask to read my application and was careful to give me the trust and space to figure out what I wanted to say on my own. After I was accepted, he organized a lunch with a group of his impressive peers, as you've also heard about, um, from school to reminisce and strategize about what I wanted to do in college and afterward. I didn't find out for another year that he had quietly arranged and submitted several additional letters of recommendation on my behalf. <laughs> this is who he was, a firm hand with a soft touch. 
It's an example I try best to follow. Hi, I'm Sarah, uh, Carolyn's daughter. Um, so we are here at the alma mater that shaped my grandfather early on, as we've heard. Um, and he shared it with numerous family members, including my brother Jeremy and me. Um, to celebrate his, his life, a wonderful man whom we've heard many great things about today. But we would be remiss not also to celebrate the wonderful accomplishments and great life of his wife and my grandma Boots, who sits here today as a beacon of health and vitality. We've heard how in so many ways my grandfather was ahead of his time. So too is my grandmother, who received her master's in special education at Fairfield University in the 70s while raising three young daughters and actively participating in the League of Women Voters. And her PhD from NYU in the 1980s, commuting back and forth from DC while my grandfather was at PBS. Grandma Boots has dedicated her life both to her family and to education as a teacher at Greenwich Junior High and a professor for many years at the City University of New York and later NYU. This deep devotion to education clearly rubbed off on my grandfather, who late in his career took up the Digital Promise Project. My grandmother served as his constant editor, constructive critic, confidant, and an eternal source of encouragement, always developing independent opinions and pushing my grandfather and everyone around her to develop their own through an engaged dialogue. Grandpa, I miss you so much and think about you constantly. I'm so grateful to both you and Grandma for building such a strong, caring, and loving family that we can always depend on for support, aspiration, and guidance. I'm so glad I have the chance to stand beside my brother and my cousins as we think of you here today. Hello, I'm so happy to be here. I'm Karen Cater, President and CEO of Digital Promise. At Digital Promise, as you've heard, we owe so much of our existence to Larry. He was a true visionary, and he embodied our mission to spur innovation in order to provide the best possible learning environments and opportunities for all Americans through powerful media, technologies, all the time grounded in research. I met Larry in 2010, soon after I began my post at the U.S. Department of Education. He, along with his colleague Anne Murphy, visited often, probably weekly, seemed like. They were deeply committed to ensuring a successful launch of Digital Promise, an entity which had been authorized by Congress as part of the 2008 Higher Education Act, as you heard from Newt Minow. For close to a dozen years prior, Larry and his colleagues had designed this idea and then championed to pursue this vision to fulfill the promise of the digital and internet age. And specifically, the idea was just as we set aside public lands in the Land Grant Act to support higher education for all Americans, the idea was to set aside dollars from the sale of Spectrum to support online education for all Americans. As Larry and Ann mentored me throughout the process of launching Digital Promise, I learned much about the role of government, what you can, can't do, how to move around things more nimbly. But much more importantly, I learned the power inherent in passion, perseverance, and deep experience. With an initial board of directors appointed by the then US Secretary of Education, Arne Duncan, President Barack Obama formally launched Digital Promise in September of 2011. And Larry was, till the end, an integral part of the inaugural board. The last time I saw Larry was when Alberta accompanied him from their home in Connecticut to Washington, DC. And although his voice was not strong, each time he spoke, everyone listened carefully. What he shared represented not only a depth of understanding of the complex issues, but also powerful encouragement for this, his passion project, perhaps his capstone project, 
and I felt encouragement for myself personally. Digital Promise would not have come to fruition without Larry's vision, born of his lifelong career in media. Larry knew that when everyone has access, when everyone participates, and when everyone learns, we all benefit from more in, a, a more engaged, informed, and just society. Required reading for new employees is the speech that Larry gave to the National Coalition of Independent Scholars in 2015, which was carefully constructed, probably with some, some editing and support from those in this room. It was called A Personal Journey Through the New Digital Media Landscape. We're forever grateful for his tenacity and unwavering support, and we'll seek to carry forward his powerful vision, seeking to fulfill the promise and ensure that all Americans have the opportunity to gain access to lifelong learning and career opportunities. We deeply miss his wisdom and his passion and his advocacy. I can only imagine how much you, his family, and close friends miss him. My deepest sympathy to you and my deepest grat gratitude for a life of purpose exceedingly well lived. Thank you. My name is Sandy Cohen. I'm one of Larry and Boots's three sons-in-law. I'm joined by the other two, Andy and Andy. Um, we sort of lack originality, I know, but we get along. The last time I was in this building was uh, in 1983, when Larry received from the Alumni Association a John Jay Award for Distinguished Professional Achievement. Other recipients were former Federal Reserve Chair Arthur Burns, Dr. Bob Butler, the father of gerontology, uh, and George Stark um, of the famous offensive line of the late 70s Washington Redskins, known as the Hogs. He was the head hog. Before that, I was last in this building in 1973, disrupting a university senate meeting to protest Columbia tuition increases. It was a very successful effort. Tuition then was an exorbitant $3,300 a year. But we kept it down. Now it's a modest $58,000. Uh, apologies to Dean Quigley. And it was a learning experience too, along with four other Columbia College students. I spent the better part of the spring semester fighting disciplinary charges. I managed to escape with a minor reprimand, and the, and the experience fortified my inclination to become a lawyer. Even then, and this was earlier in my relationship with Larry, he offered me support and guidance. He was particularly mortified to learn that the then pres president of Columbia, Bill McGill, greeted the protesters, Susan among them, wearing a Groucho Marx mask. Larry could have been a hard act for his son-in-law's sons-in-law to follow if he hadn't made certain that he wasn't. From a modest Midwood childhood and the famed Columbia class of 52, he worked his way up to the top of his industry, president of PBS and NBC News, and so many other accomplishments that could be awe-provoking. Now more than occasionally, the success worked well for his sons-in-law. Uh, like when he was able to get us World Series tickets through NBC to see the Mets vanquish the hated Red Sox, or when he and Boots helped us to buy our houses. Larry was smart, knowledgeable, thoughtful. He was fair. He was public-minded. He was a good schmoozer and a good storyteller. We often didn't agree on the important issues of the day, but there was a never-ending, wide-ranging, passionate discussion about the issues whenever the family assembled. And there could be as many as 25 or 30 of us competing to be heard. Larry, who was an accomplished debater, always set his skills aside so that everybody could air an opinion, and usually everybody did. 
Larry was forever unruffled. In the 45 years that I was around him, I never saw Larry lose his temper, even on the tennis court. Well, uh, once early on, he sternly admonished that I was slicing tomatoes for the dinner salad the wrong way, but he did it without any rancor. At the same time, he prospered in his profession. He had a wonderful family life with a beautiful wife and three beautiful daughters whom he adored and who adored him. He set such a good example for me and for Andy and for Andy. Yes. Okay. I saw somebody who worked hard and with integrity at his job and succeeded and kept his family intact. He and Boots always provided support to Susan and me when we needed it and showed me what it means to be a loving parent. Larry also taught me what a good single malt scotch is. He took pride in and was attentive to his grandchildren. Numerous times he traveled to forsaken places in Brooklyn, Westchester, or Long Island to watch Rebecca lead her high school volleyball team or Ben to play one of his three varsity sports. He was, also, he was always interested in what they were learning in school and later what they are accomplishing in their jobs. I hope that I can be half as attentive to my grandchildren as he was to his. For the last few years, Susan and I have been fortunate to be able to spend a lot of weekends with Larry and Boots in Westport. And as you know and have heard today, Larry fought through a number of medical challenges in those years. He did it with great strength and dignity, rarely complaining about the physical or other obstacles he confronted. Instead, he was always interested in how we and our kids were doing. A week or two before he died, I went up to Westport after a Saturday round of golf in the city. Larry was by that time pretty weak and he was declining, having difficulty eating and talking. When I walked into his bedroom to say hello, the first thing that came to his mind was to ask me, how did you do? I, I was dumbstruck and wondered, and I still wonder, how did he learn to make other people feel so important? I hope someday, sooner rather than later, I learn the answer to that question. Hi, I'm Jenny Zandi. And yes, Larry always got a kick out of introducing us. This is Sandy, Andy, and Andy. Early Larry memories for me were playing tennis with him, the three of us and him. He always looked sharp in his all whites. We played doubles. We also played Canadian doubles. Two of us against him. Games would always start out close, but then he'd turn on the heat, hitting balls into every corner, making us run really hard. He was a pro on the court. And I don't think we ever beat him at tennis. He was always an easygoing guy. Once, Larry and Boots were away for a weekend, and when they came back to Westport, they found that the three of us, without their permission, had cemented in a basketball pole and hoop into the driveway. We said, oh, it's for the grandkids. And Larry looked a little in disbelief, smiled, and he calmly walked away. And for many years, all of us had fun when Grandpa Larry would come shoot baskets with the grandkids. Other fond memories, Sunday morning breakfast, Larry would always make hand-squeezed fresh orange juice for everyone, whether it was for five or 25 people. Now, how many guys do that? Just Grandpa Larry. Before dinners, he would be so gracious, offering up drinks to everybody, beer, wine, scotch. And he loved his McAllen, a Jewish guy from Brooklyn. Go figure, right? Three, under one, three other wonderful Larry traits. He'd always ask you how things are, and he'd really listen to your answer. He never had an unkind word or complaint. 
and he always saw the positive side in everything. All great lessons from Larry that we have forever. Thank you. Well, I guess you know by now I'm Andy. <laughs> Carolyn's Andy. After having placed a Seeking Roommate ad in the Tufts Daily Student Paper, I soon found myself dating the daughter of Lawrence K. Grossman, president of PBS. I was frankly a bit apprehensive and intimidated. A few weeks after we moved into our apartment, Larry was in town on business at PBS and uh, Carolyn made plans to go and rendezvous with him in Cambridge for dinner. And as it turned out, Carolyn had a summer internship at the Children's Museum and must have been running late because she had a python wrapped around her educating children about snakes, which fortunately she stopped doing when we had children. Um, so she was late and I got to the restaurant and uh, was looking around for Larry a man I'd never even seen a picture of. When I saw the guy with the impressive eyebrows, I knew it had to be Larry. And it was. He broke the ice and told me how his cab driver warned him that the food at this restaurant was rather salty. He thought that was hysterical. <laughs> the day our daughter Sarah was born, Larry and Boots jumped into the car in Connecticut and came up to see their newest grandchild, Sarah. Larry was undoubtedly very eager because he got pulled over on the mass turnpike going 90 <laughs> and didn't even realize he was speeding. Not one to ever invoke any special privilege, Larry neglected to tell the officer the reason for his alacrity, which might have got him a, a warning instead of a ticket. Sadly, he got a ticket. When Larry was teaching at the Kennedy School, we had the good fortune of being nearby and able to attend lectures and seminars that Larry gave as a First Amendment professor in the Stanton Chair. And uh, this was always a great pleasure and got to introduce our children as well to um, the Kennedy School, which Sarah eventually went to. At one conference, Larry reconnected with an old friend the legendary Betty Friedan. And he invited her to come back to our house in Waltham for some takeout Indian food. This was a pretty magical moment, having the feminine mystique author um, able to pass that baton on, in some sense, to our family. Since Larry was blessed with three daughters, he had a special appreciation for his sons-in-law. However, as you've already heard, he showed us absolutely no mercy on the tennis court and was unbeatable, frankly. And he never seemed to get tired. And I think that is because he placed those shots so carefully it made us run quite a bit. It was a sad day when Larry announced that his tennis days were over due to his Parkinson's diagnosis. Larry's bout with Parkinson's was extremely difficult but it was truly amazing and, and inspiring to see how he did not let it interfere with life. Nothing could stop Larry from making fresh squeezed orange juice every morning and Grandpa Larry eggs on weekends for brunch. At Thanksgiving, even when his hands were unsteady from Parkinson's, he would fearlessly use a meat cleaver to hack at the carcass of the Thanksgiving turkey and send us home with delicious leftovers. If that sounds slightly terrifying, that's because it was. <laughs> During Larry's illness, I often ask myself if I could endure all that he went through and still have a positive attitude and the will to fight, which he had till his very last days. Larry drew strength from the incredible care that Boots and daughters gave every day 
and the boundless love from family and friends that never waned. I love very, Larry very much. I am proud to be his son-in-law, and I admire him and am and inspired by him in so many ways. I'm very glad that I put the ad in the college paper. My name is Richard Wald. <clears throat> it takes a university to have acoustics like this. <laughs> we have an engineering school. They don't know what to do about it. Um, my life and Larry's were intertwined in many ways. We were both fired from the same job. I am the person who holds the keys to this particular kingdom. I am the person who gets to say those valuable words <clears throat> in conclusion. Larry was an interesting man, but I'd like to correct, alter slightly, one of the many encomia you have heard. Um, it happened just after the first operation for cancer, when uh, there was a question of culpability. And I was summoned to a lawyer's office somewhere in Man Manhattan downtown. And um, the question was, was Larry employable? You have to understand, they had just finished some of the road work on his face, and he was swathed, for those of you who can remember Claude Rains in The Invisible Man, in bandages that went around his jaw, his face, his side, his ear. Uh, and he was sitting there, and one of the lawyers said, uh, what would he do if he went to work for you? And I said, well, we had a job. It was an interesting thing. Uh, we were setting up for a millennial series of programs. And he would go out and uh, drum up business for it. And the lawyer said, pointing at him, he'd be a salesman? The point being, he was all wrapped up. Who would, and he didn't get to finish it. Larry said, nobody notices this. <laughs> he was not perceptive about everything. <laughs> what you have heard from all these people who loved him was the mark of a man. Larry was a citizen in the old-fashioned word. He shared the action and passion of his time. He shared getting involved to make things better. At this university, we were taught that there are many paths in philosophy, but the two broad avenues are to understand those things that you cannot see and those things that you do see and understand, Plato and Aristotle. Larry was an Aristotelian. He dealt with the things you could see the things you could make better, the things you could work with, the things that humans thought to be good. We who knew him and saw that community around him have gathered 
most of us today to say that. He was involved with us all the time. It is not, Larry was not a person who was deeply involved in the spiritual world. He was not a person who was touchy-feely. But he was someone who had the values and virtues of older civilizations. And I'd like to read to you the statement that Ulysses made to his men for his final voyage when he said that he wanted to sail beyond the horizon. What he said was, and this is a translation, I speak no Greek of any kind, though much is taken, he was old, and he was worried about his crew. Though much is taken, much abides. And though we are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heavens, that which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. In conclusion, thank you for coming and celebrating this man. I want to say thank you again. I want to say thank you again for coming. In fact, the, the purpose was to reclaim Larry Grossman. You did it. And, and we hope everybody will stay and join us for a reception. It's here in this room.